Bonjour, mon ami. Bonjour, comment ça va? Uh, ça va bien. That's the end of my French, though. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very good. At least you hit the bien part, ah, which, is, bien. which is difficult. People say bien. bien or bien, uh, you know, yes. bien, with a soft N. That's good. Well, look, I grew up in Canada, so I learned high school French. Right. So where well, in Canada did you grow up? I grew up in Toronto, well, just outside of Toronto. I grew up in Pickering. Okay, right. So Ooh. I can... Uh, I can conjugate the verb etra, which is, uh, you know, like, it's going to help me in zero situations ever. Well, hold on now. You can conjugate some of the verb être. Like, there's a lot of, a lot of tenses. Elle est, nous sommes, vous êtes, ils ont, ils ont. Good. Now, can you do passé composé? Qu'il ait été, que j'ai été. No. Yeah. I didn't See, get it's, that it's, far. I'm yeah, sorry. French is ridiculously complicated. Needlessly complicated. I mean, I feel like if I were to walk into anywhere and be saying, I am, you are, he is, she is, they'd be like, what is this person doing? <laughs> right? What, when did you learn to speak English? Uh, so I want to say that I remember when I started doing Taekwondo, I was 11 years old, or I was about to turn 12. And I could hold the conversation in English, but I made a lot of mistakes, like a lot of grammatical errors. And my accent was a lot more present than it is now. Um, so probably not like till a couple of years before that, though I always had a sense, like I, I heard English, I knew what it sounded like. I knew yeah. what it was meant to sound like. I couldn't quite speak it. Like I remember when I started playing uh, video games, I would have my father translate <laughs> for me because uh, I couldn't, couldn't understand what, the, what was happening. So you went to school in French? I went to school in French, yeah. So, so they, they thought English, but that was like half of the half oh, of the so the exact opposite of what I was to, you know just describing. Right. And for anybody wondering, our conversation at the beginning of this uh, was, "Hello, my friend. How are you? I'm good." And that was the end of it. Which is what most people get out of learning French as a secondary language. Uh, I can also cool. say, uh, "Où est la salle de bain?" That's good. Where's the bathroom? That's very, Where very is the useful. Bathroom? So the issue with learning French is that a majority of the people who speak French also speak English. Like, right. especially, especially in Quebec, very few people don't also speak English. Like the, the official language of Quebec is, is bilingual, no matter what people say. Most people speak and understand both. So there's like, unless you really want to do some specific work in French, yeah. there's a very little point to actually learning it. And it's incredibly difficult. It, I'm so glad that I didn't like, I, I'm so glad that I didn't, you know, continue to learn it more because it was confusing as much as, yeah, as, as far as I went in it. Right. Confu confusing and mostly useless. So <laughs> have you, did you ever run into situations where you're like, ah, oh, I wish I knew French. So I went to the South of France. I was at the Cannes Film Festival like 10 years ago. And uh -huh. I was with all my friends who were American. I had already lived in the U S at this point for like two years And we wanted someone to take a photo. And I was like, hold on a second. Um, uh, photo? And someone was like, do you want me to take a photo of you? I'm like, oh my God, I could have just asked in English. That's what I'm saying. Everyone who speaks French also speaks English or understands it well enough to be able to, you know, take your, take your picture if you want. So yeah, I'm, and then you're right. They're, like that's one of the languages where if you speak this one, you probably also speak the other one. If you speak French, you probably also speak English. But you, you don't really have that much of an accent now. Thank you. So I, that's something I regret, uh, especially when it comes to professional wrestling, because I, I don't have much of an accent, though it does come out when I speak, you know, you don't when have I speak like faster. The, you don't have like the George St. Pierre French-Canadian mm -hmm. accent. So no, I don't, but I wish I did. Are you serious? Because I 100%, because I worked hard to make that accent go away and to speak, you know, quote, unquote, proper english but now like the pressure's on when i'm doing like promos or something english is still my second language it still doesn't come completely naturally right but if i if i did all my promos like this you know then i could i could uh, mix up some words and people would go ah oh, you, you know it's okay english is a second language he's trying he's trying so hard do you know what i mean? was so not I think it's impressed a mistake with your performance Yes, yeah, see, you can say things like that, and uh, it's okay. No one, no one questions it, and no one says, oh, that guy, you cannot talk on the mic. They just say he has an accent. And then you just have to say, you know, after every few words. You and, know. Uh, 
you have to talk about wrestlers like Hedge and Christian. Yeah. So the 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 letter H is a very difficult one. T H, and then word to, words that starts with H, mixing up uh, air and hair, oh, is a very yes. common one. And they just people just switch it, and I don't know why. It's not like they never use it. It's like yeah. they, they use it when it's not there, and they don't use it when it's there. Oh, that is so funny. But maybe maybe you work that into the speedball character somehow. Well, uh, keep your eyes on the IPWF that just came out, and you might meet a certain Monsieur Baguette, oh. who is from. Uh, was it, was oh, a, this is the is this the thing you posted on Instagram recently? This is the thing I posted on Instagram. Oh, yes, this, this was so a... exciting because I love random Simpsons quotes. And when you posted <laughs> that, it said, "That man is my exact double. Dog has a fluffy tail." <laughs> I was like, I was like. Oh. I yeah, uh, I know that when I am much, much older and demented, I'm going to be speaking only in Simpsons quotes. I was having this conversation not long ago with Ryan Nemeth of just like, there's so many ridiculous Simpsons quotes that just like, you know, you might know them and you just say them in everyday, you know, life. And other people are like, I don't know what you mean. Like my friends and I used to always say, we would go to all you can eat chicken wing buffets. And we would always reference the Lionel Hutz thing. Do these sound like the actions of a man who's had all he could eat? <laughs> there's, there's so many great lines. I, I've gotten into the habit of pulling out my phone and I know exactly what to search on YouTube in order to find the clip. And just like, rather than saying it myself, just pulling out the clip. It's a little bit more context. Which one? That way. So the one I've been using a lot recently okay. is uh, when they are introducing the astronauts or the people they sent into space yep. in the latest space minute mission and it's a uh, you've got a statistician a mathematician and a different kind of mathematician and they just look all the same <laughs> uh, which happens a lot in wrestling when they'll introduce a lineup and it'll be like just exactly the same person yeah. <laughs> three times now that the world cup is going on i keep referencing when the simpsons was yes soccer are you yeah. ready for a fast kicking, low scoring, and ties? <laughs> the, when the commentators, when the Camp Rockman is just, he passes to the left, passes to the right, back to center, and then the Spanish commentator is just it. going crazy. Holds it. Holds it. <laughs> and then they, you're right, they cut to the Spanish. Holds it. Announcer. Holds it. Holds it. Yeah. It's great. It's fantastic. Well, I can't wait to meet uh, Monsieur Baguette. Yeah, I uh, will. Uh, it's on the Impact Plus app. It's on Impact Ultimate Insiders, which I'm always happy to plug. They call you SBMB. I'm, I'm sorry? Does anybody call you SBMB? Speedball Mike Bailey, SBMB. I, no, actually, no. They, they haven't, but I think they should. I'm sure someone has. Mm. Now uh, I have. You now you have yeah now it now it's a thing. Now I feel like like when someone says SpongeBob SquarePants, I always go to SBSP, and they're like, "What?" Oh. I'm like SBSP, and now you're SBMB. I so over the it's mostly through Twitch that I've given myself a lot of nicknames. Ooh, let's hear them and all. Uh, well, so the number one is Uncle Speedy. Uh, that that one goes by a lot, and I don't know why I've, I've I've become an uncle, but I feel like that's the the place I occupy within the the, the hashtag Speed Fam, which is uh, because family comes first, which is a Fast and Furious reference, which is very important to uh, my family. Twitch canon. Family. <laughs> I live my life a quarter mile at a time. Yeah. That's the Vin Diesel voice. That was really is good. This this is the interview yeah <laughs> it's the most that? important part of the interview actually we're just gonna we're just gonna do vin diesel impressions and <laughs> simpsons references for an hour oh my friend that would be too easy oh, it would be too easy wouldn't it too easy oh. see the hard part is to talk about professional wrestling well you know you've talked about pro wrestling in every other interview that you've done switch it up but, a little bit so to be fair, a lot of a lot of like podcasts and stuff will do this. They'll be like, "Hey, man, I don't talk about professional wrestling. I want to talk to wrestlers about everything else. I want to talk about you know anything but professional wrestling." And here's yeah. the thing about me: 
I love professional wrestling and I'm, I'm completely unashamed about it. I will talk about professional wrestling for days and days and days. And if you get me going, I will just not stop. And I don't know. I, I feel like it's not cool among professional wrestlers to talk about how much they love professional wrestling. And I'm just completely unashamed about it. I don't know. Or maybe it's on the flip side of it. It's like, they just assume like, this is something you talk about all the time that the last thing you want to do is talk about like, the match that got you into it or your favorite opponent or something like that. Right. So I'm sure you have thoughts on this as well. Right. The, the other, the other thing that you hear is, Oh, I don't ask the question that, that everyone asks, like how you got into wrestling and how you got your start and your background and everything. But I feel like if you, like, if you're going to interview a professional wrestler about, you know, their career, that's the kind of things that people want to, might want to know and that you I, might need to ask. And I feel I, like it's on me to have interesting answers for that. Well, I, and I also get that this may be for some people that are watching this or listening to this, this may be their first speedball Mike Bailey interviews. So like, well, I, I think hopefully I, it is. I, I mean, that's the whole point of this, right? Hopefully it is as well. And aside from the, you know, fun antics of the Simpsons and uh, everything else that's going on there, like, yeah, you know, we're going to dig into what makes Mike Bailey, Mike Bailey. But I think we need to start with what is a speedball? So this uh, speedball is the piece of boxing equipment that just you you hit and it and it rebounds. Um, and the reason that I was nicknamed Speedball Mike Bailey is because there was a, a his name was Michael Ryan. He wrote about Montreal wrestling. He's since passed away, but in one of my early matches, he described my in ring style as bouncing around the ring like a speedball. Mm. And a big part of the reason I love that nickname is because I didn't give it to myself. Which is very rare in the in these these hard times. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of wrestlers that go, "That would look good on a T-shirt." That is my new name. Yes, and it usually ends up sounding badass, right? That, that's usually like it's the people, the monster, right? right. Some, but then, but then, like Chris Jericho tells stories of like trying to get nicknames over or trying to get catchphrases over and being like, "Yeah, yeah, didn't work." Right. Um, and, and speedball, I like because again, it, it begs the question: What is a speedball? Hmm. Do you know I, what I mean? Which, which I think what is more interesting comes to mind for me is like Sonic the Hedgehog when you hold oh, wow. down and he literally turns into a ball of speed and then like explodes out of there. See, that's that's not exactly what it is, but it's the right kind of imagery. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's still within the realm of what it's supposed to represent. Well, the great thing about the name Speedball Mike Bailey is if someone's never seen one of your matches and they see your name on the card and then they see you wrestle, they go, oh, yeah, like lives up to the name. So, yes, I think so. Um, also, I like the name Mike Bailey a lot, which is not my real name. If you want to know my real name, it's not hard to find at all. In fact, it's Emile Bayergeon La Verge. Uh, it's like it's not difficult and it's all over the internet. It's very French, very hard to pronounce. Is, yeah, very French. Play. Play. We'll see. When I used to do Taekwondo tournaments outside of Quebec and they would have to call my name on the PA because, you know, it was my turn to fight and they would have to say Emile Bayergeon La Berge. It all just, I'd, I'd have to wait and hear the, like the name of my, my, the, the school that I was representing and then be like, is this me? Because they would never get it how right. How would they normally, like, how would an English person say your name? So Emile is not that difficult, but it's not, it's, I, I hear Emil which the, I know there are Emils out there. I hear Emil, Emile, people would go a lot, but Bayergeon, B-A-I-L-L-A-R-G-E-O-N. Yeah. Bailargon, Blargon, Bayergeon, Bayergeon. Laburge is kind of straightforward, mm -hmm. but it comes at the end. It's also a hyphenated last name, which is just a mess, a complete mess. Yeah. Do you think of how different your career may have been? Like you were doing Taekwondo and martial arts early in your um, life when UFC wasn't quite the UFC that we know now. Do you think that if maybe you were 11 years old now doing Taekwondo, that maybe your career would have gone a completely different way? So I think so, but the, uh, I am not, uh, I like, I'm not spiteful. And the thing that I never had in, in any like combat sports that I did was like, you know, that, that anger, that rage, that desire to beat my opponent and knock him out. You know, I just wanted to win. I wanted to be technically superior and win. And that was much more interesting to me. And I never had any animosity towards my 
opponents. Like e- even if they, which is again very much reflected in my in my professional wrestling and my persona on screen. But I never had any animosity. Like even if they tried to like cheat, I'd be like, yeah, I I, I understand what you're doing. I understand what you're doing in it, and it doesn't really bother me. Um, and I think that's why pro wrestling worked better for me than actual like competitive combat sports because I like I, I prefer teamwork to mm-hmm. outright competition. I prefer working together in order to achieve a goal than trying to you know uh, beat up another person. Like I know that pro wrestling is not the only avenue for that, and there's like you know lots of uh, stunts and stuff is something that I I almost uh, went into at one point. Mm. And was you know certainly interested in, and there's a lot of other avenues for that. But pro wrestling really fits my personality well, and much better than competing in MMA would have. Well, the interesting thing about stunts is that could be something that you do 10, 15, 20 years from now when you're no longer wrestling. It absolutely could be, but unfortunately, pro wrestling is working out quite well for me right now. I'd say. So I, I don't have any plans. That's to why like, I said 20 years yeah. from now. <laughs> Oof. We'll we'll see about twenty years from now. But yeah. When when do you feel like on this trajectory things really started to shift for you in your wrestling career? So there's been many moments where like it it's come in such small increments. I've been wrestling for uh, seventeen years. I'm thirty two years old, which is I started when I was fifteen, and I started from literally the bottom, like the. Uh, it was in Quebec, which so there was a language barrier that kind of cut off the whole province from the rest of the world. And then there's a physical border between Quebec and the U.S. I started uh, taking bookings in January 2006. Wow. And later that year is when Kevin Steen wrestled Christopher Daniels in Quebec City. And that match was the first time in a very, very long time, like in decades, that anyone was ever brought from outside of Quebec to wrestle in Quebec. Wow. And that's how, just that's just how isolated and, and, and difficult that was uh, at the time. So just all this to say that there's been a lot of moments where, you know, I was just doing wrestling and then I thought, oh, this is going pretty well. And then it wasn't. And then it was again. And then. Yeah, I feel like you were so like I, the best kept secret on the indies for a long, long time. And it's no longer a secret anymore. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, up until the beginning of this year, I was number one on all these greatest wrestler you've never heard of lists that pop up, which is which is great. However, I'd like to be the uh, greatest wrestler you've also heard of. Well, then that's where you are now. And, I, and you're getting this incredible <laughs> platform you. with Impact Wrestling. Uh, you're having some matches that are making people go, oh, wow. That's mm-hmm. why I tune into Impact. Yeah. uh, And it's been great. It's been great to, you know, finally get to do on a bigger platform what I had been doing. Uh, I think PWG was a great example of that because up until, you know, last year, people would still go, oh, Speedball Mike Bailey. I love his match with uh, Roderick Strong, which happened in like 2015. And I had been, you know, wrestling in Japan for DDT for like four years at this point. And I'd had way better matches there. Not because, you know, not because... I had been wrestling better opponents because there are very few than, you know, than Roger Strong, but I, I've gotten so much better in so many aspects over those, over the five years that I couldn't come into the U S. Um, so it's still, it sucked to have people judge me on what I was five years ago. And it's even worse to have people go, Oh, you were great five years ago. And it's like, well, I am a lot better now. I am now. (laughs) Right. And it, it was great to be able to come back to PWG in the beginning of the year and change up that perspective. I interviewed Josh Alexander earlier this week. So as this airs about two weeks ago, and he was like, wait till you see the match that I have with Speedball on Impact. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's a big one. What is it about wrestling with someone like him that kind of pulls the magic out of both of you? I think it's hard work. I think it's we both have a, I'm sure... Josh told you his story and hopefully everyone who's listening has listened to your interview with Josh as well. But he and I like kind of mirror each other in the way that we come from Canada and we had a very, very difficult path, completely differently, but very difficult path in order to get to where we are now uh, with his injuries, both of us dealing with the border and just, you know, I think he and I are both in a place where we take absolutely nothing for granted. 
and we are we realize how blessed we are to be doing what we're doing now as a job and that we get paid to do professional wrestling which i think is very very easy for a lot of people to to forget but uh I don't know if he talked about it with you, but he, you know, he worked construction yep. up until quite recently. And he had a, you know, he had jobs and, you know, uh, I, I worked uh, up until like, I want to say 2016 or 15, I think I was a, a janitor. I, I cleaned a university at nighttime and I used to make, you know, uh, I don't know, $18 an hour, $19 in, in 2015 money, which is a lot more than, it is now, but I, you know, every time I I go in the ring and I get to do what I love and get paid for it. I remember just how hard I worked at something I hated in order to be able to do what I love in my spare time. And I think Josh is the same way. And I think we both have no qualms about working as hard as we need to. And, you know, our, our, the effort that we've put into our lives in order to get where we are, just comes through in the matches. I think it's that idea that if you're going to have to work for the rest of your life, and this was a big epiphany for me when I was finishing university, if you're going to have to do something for the rest of your life, why not like try as hard as you possibly can to do something that you love doing? And, and if you try really hard and it doesn't work out, at least you know that you tried. Oh my God. It's the biggest privilege to, like, to be able to do something that you love is the biggest thing because uh, again speaking about my career there are many moments where i was settled into you know i'm going to do something that i hate in order to be able to do things that i love in my free time Mm -hmm. and and you know settle into that and going like okay this is fine this is going to be my life and now that the i have the opportunity to do what i love for a living it's great Josh and I talked about how important it is that Scott Demore is Canadian because it's it's almost like he gives fellow Canadian wrestlers that edge of like, all right, look, I know this isn't going to be easy, but knowing what I know, impact wrestling can help bring you in. Absolutely. I think people don't realize, I, I know for a fact that people are not aware of the caliber of talent that there is in Canada. The man, the wrestling landscape is wild. It's completely different now than when I started. It's it's completely evolving. For a lot of people, this is how their path went. Right, they uh, start wrestling training in 2018. They get a uh, they get a match on AW Dark after they've been wrestling for you know six to eight months, and then and now they're trying to get signed and they're getting tryouts and stuff. Where I wrestled for you know five years until I received the first envelope that had five Canadian dollars in it. And that was my pay. And before that, I just, you know, he, not even a handshake five and a hot dog. Years of wrestling for free though. Five years of wrestling for free. Yeah. Wow. But it, like, and, and it's not because anyone was taking advantage of me it's just because no one was making money because again, mm-hmm. this is pre social media where the only way to advertise your wrestling shows is by, you know, stapling the flyers to telephone poles and, waiting outside of WWE house shows to try to hand out flyers and get people there. And you're not bringing in anyone. There's no draw. There's no big names. No one's making money. Yeah. I think that when I talk to fellow Americans, well, I'm not an American, talk to other people that live in America and they're trying to be a pro wrestler, they take for granted the great privilege that they have of being able to travel all around the country and see all the different cities and showcase their abilities. And when you live in Canada, you know that there's so many more opportunities on the other side of the border. But as you touched on, and I know it was a big part of your story, you know, crossing the border as a Canadian is not an easy thing, especially if you're trying to do something where you're making money in the States. Yep, that's absolutely right. Uh, and it, you know, Canada is in a weird position because the, that border is right there. Do you know what I mean? It's it's yep. a lot of people live physically a two hour drive down from a promotion that will offer them an incredible amount of visibility compared to what they have access to in Canada. 90% of Canadians live within a hundred miles of the U S border. So that's right. Yeah. It's almost the whole country. Yeah. Basically that, you know, and uh, the, the, the amount of visibility, like in, especially for independent wrestling in the U S with like IWTV and fight plus and how easy it is to, put your show on a big platform that people will have access to with, with discoverability. 
I mean, that's a huge step in, you know, getting a following online and then growing your career that way. And uh, but also, like, I, we talk about Canada a lot, and it's, you know, that's where I'm from, and it's very important. But I wish that there was a, a, a better avenue in order for the greater public to discover promotions like uh, Grapple Max in Singapore that have fantastic shows and promotions. There's great wrestling over in France that, uh, you know, with fantastic wrestlers that people don't know about. And uh, I, I like, it's a thing that I try to do as much as possible, like raise awareness of all the fantastic world-class talent that people have no idea about because it's too far outside of America. I think people saw the headline of you getting turned away at the border and everything that happened there in 2016. And they don't realize everything that likely went up until that point. Like, I think people might read that story and go, well, Mike showed up to the border and they, uh, you know, they said, you can't come in, but how many other times had you crossed and they had kind of gone, oh, we're going to, we're going to flag your, we're going to flag your passport. So it, it hadn't happened. I was, I was fine uh, up until that point. But again, it's it's extremely tricky. And the thing about the border is that everything is up to the agent, right? They don't they don't really need a reason to turn you around. And they don't need a reason to like look further into your things either. They can just decide, you know, I don't like your face. Well, we're gonna go and and do a deep dive into everything you say. Um and also the the part that is uh, is complicated is that for you know, every speedball Mike Bailey and Josh Alexander that, you know, had uh, issues at the border and then saw it through the end, there's a hundred more Canadians that you've never heard of because they weren't able to pick up enough steam. And by the time, you know, they got turned around before they were able to actually get their name out there. And it's been so much harder for them ever since. I was lucky that I'd been able to do, you know, PWG and CZW and Evolve and a bunch of higher echelon places. And then when I was not no longer able to get into the US, I was able to go to England and Japan and, you know, uh, Germany and wherever else because I had picked up enough notoriety in order to be able to have my name out there and be attractive to promotions overseas. So what was it like on that day? You, you hand over your passport, you get to the border, they say, you know, where are you going? What are you doing? And then do you immediately go, oh, this is not going well? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to go in, in detail into it because, you know, the, the, the truth is a lot more sad and boring than you would imagine. But um, there, there was that uh, big realization of, you know, your career is going to go way differently than you thought it would. Do you know what I mean? Because the, the plan at the time was, you know, I'm, I'm finally wrestling in front of people that could make decisions and, you know, could change my career. And I know that Evolve was being very closely looked at as the time. And if you look at everyone that was on those PWG shows with me in that period, they, you know, most of them went to NXT or New Japan or are now in AEW. In fact, almost all are in, if you were to run down a card, like everyone's in AEW Seriously. or yeah. at that point, it's wild. Yeah. Um, so to go from their like realization that that's not going to happen for you, at least not for five years is of course very difficult to deal with. Uh, but you know, I'd already been wrestling for 10 years at this point. And like I mentioned, I didn't get paid for the first five. So I'd been doing this just because I loved it for long enough. I wasn't about to stop. So you're like, this is the perfect example of taking a bad situation and like putting a shine on it and making it work out for you because you basically said, all right, that's one country I can't wrestle in, but look at all the other countries that I can wrestle in. Yeah. Uh, and luckily, like I had already been in touch with DDT before that and uh, Rev Pro was, uh, was a lot of help. And as soon as they, as soon as that happened, they were the first ones to reach out to me and go, hey, come and spend two weeks and we'll, you know, will do something uh i yeah ddt had already reached out to me and i had i like i couldn't do the dates they offered because i was already going to mexico at this point to triple a for a couple months but as soon as that happened i i reached back out to them and they were like yeah come on and their initial offer from ddt was yeah uh okay just burn your passport and we'll get you japanese citizenship and you can you can stay here uh which was very interesting but you know, I, I was always kind of looking ahead at the end of those five years. And my my goal was to raise my value as much as I can, which meant performing in as many different places at the same time as possible. 
yeah. in order so that uh, in order to get where I am now. But I just love that you were able to take a bad situation and turn it into something good because I think there's a lot of people in different aspects of their life that would take something that in the moment is seemingly as crushing as that and go, well, never going to happen. Forget it. And you were able to go, okay, well, this is just a speed bump in the road for speed ball. Wow. Very well done. Very you made well it done. work. I did. Yeah. Look, I was such a huge fan of TNA. And now that you're in there and you're part of the X division, who's a match that you wish you could have, or who's, what's a match you wish you could have with somebody that was part of that, like early days of the X division in TNA. Oh man. There's so many. Uh, AJ, AJ Styles is of course, number one. And I think the person that will forever be associated with TNA, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, but man, that, that early X division roster was something, uh, you look at it like Jerry Lynn matches from that time, amazing red doing absolutely fantastic Saban. Who's been there from the beginning, who is still one of the best. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see. Um, and I, I thought I've, what is unique about the X division is that it's been able to, for so long, maintain its identity, which is very, very rare in professional wrestling. Like you think of the like intercontinental championship in WWE, and it's like, it's kind of the mid card title, but it's not associated with any particular style. Yeah. Right. Where and the X division, held, it's been held by like almost everybody so it's like yeah it's a mid-card thing but then why do main eventers keep winning it right and and like there's no people have attempted to do it like there was the you know 24 7 titles and the hardcore championships and things yeah. that end up being too specific yeah uh and kind of you know put itself within a box but the x division is still kind of an open-ended thing it's just very action-packed professional wrestling and it's maintained that identity for so long is amazing I remember when it was, it's not about weight limits, it's about no limits. And then like right. a handful of years later, they did put a weight limit on and I went, excuse me, what are you doing? <laughs> and then they quickly got rid of that. And Good, I like, yeah. Okay, I, that's that makes sense. But you're right. But like, Samoa Joe was one of the greatest X Division champions of all time. And he's, you know, obviously a heavyweight, but he like he made it work. And that's what was so impressive about him is that, you know, that the, the most X Division title match of all time, which is that three way match between uh, uh, AJ Styles, Chris Daniels and Samoa Joe, which goes a million miles an hour for 30 minutes with, yeah. you know, a heavyweight in there wrestling with two, two junior heavyweights and still doing some of the craziest stunts that ever happened. I watch that match pretty frequently and I go, don't we all, this. don't we all. I'm right. I love, I loved TNA. I remember like buying the best of AJ Styles DVDs back in the day, but mm -hmm. I just kept going back to that one match. And I'm just like this, this is why TNA was so good in the mid two thousands. Well, that's probably why the impact YouTube channel just posts it every like three and a half months <laughs> <laughs> on the channel. It gets a million views every time, which is great. Because it's, a, again, a fantastic match. Like, they, I think the anniversary of the Elix Skipper cage walk was, like, last week and <laughs> kept getting posted everywhere. And I'm like... Kept getting posted. Like, it was getting posted by non-wrestling accounts. And I was mm -hmm. just like, yeah, no, that, that's when you know you've got a great moment that transcends wrestling. Absolutely. Do you have a moment like that that's, like, what's, what's the most shared Mike Bailey moment, gif, match, whatever it might be? So... Uh, sadly, I think it's when I kicked Ninja Mac off that ledge at the uh, Ukrainian Cultural Center, uh, which I, I see sadly because I'm not doing anything. I literally just kick him and he falls off. And uh, I, like, I don't even kick him off. I just kick him and he, you know, kind of plops down there. Uh, but great yeah, spot, that one, though. that one went around. It's a great spot. It's entirely his doing. I had, it was not my idea. <laughs> you know, in, in keeping with that theme, like I interviewed Chris Harris recently, which everybody talks about the Elix Skipper cage walk and doesn't, uh -huh. they, nobody realizes that's Chris Harris on the receiving end of that Hurricane Rana. And I'm like, see, I didn't even know it was Chris Harris. And, right. Because it's just, you know, your, your eyes are focused on the movement, which is you know, death defying and insane. But yeah, yeah, it was like so few people even associate that that's, you or even associate like the entire match and who's in it. There's like, that's just a moment, which I think is actually 
Very interesting. It's a wild thing uh, to have a clip go outside of the, the the world of wrestling and get get posted on like. Oh, so I gave uh, Joey Janela a moonsault double knees through a table, and uh, I'm not sure if you saw that one, but he mm -hmm. falls like directly, like the in the center of the yeah, table, like, like a cartoon, and just disappears. So the table doesn't even like. <laughs> the table doesn't break in half. The table stays. There's just a hole in the middle that breaks, and he falls right through. And it looks, it looks wild. But that clip gets posted on like reposted by like Barstool Sports or one of those accounts that just steals clips and then posts them as their own. And uh, they don't give any credit to the people that are performing. Nah, 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 nah. Of course not. Yeah, why uh, would they do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the comments in there are like are absolutely wild because it's usually a mix of mm. complete and utter amazement. And just anger and rage yes. and people that are just angry that, that this 30-second clip has happened and it doesn't belong in professional wrestling or whatever their idea of professional wrestling is. But yeah. uh, it's, Especially when it's posted on a mainstream account, you get a lot of the people that are like, you know, some sort of terrible, awful comment about it being fake. And it's like, yeah, yeah okay, like... That would be like going on to someone posting something about Avatar and being like, you know, this is not actually blue, bro. It's all CGI. Yeah, uh, old men yelling at clouds. That just doesn't make any sense. No. I feel like you've got like new life, you know, since the border is back open to you, signed with Impact Wrestling, you know, turning a lot of heads there. What, now that you have every opportunity in front of you, what do you want to do? I mean, I'm uh, I'm gonna be with Impact Wrestling for uh, a few more years, and I'm I'm very excited about that. Uh, I want to grow along with Impact, uh, and I think that that's a that's a big part of it. I feel like I like I'm not taking any credit for it, but they have absolutely been making all the right moves, and uh, Scott has taken the company in a very very interesting direction. And uh, they have been growing. The shows have been consistently getting better. They've come out of the pandemic and just knocked it out of the park. The live events are absolutely fantastic. And I think that, I don't think there's a limit right now to what I can do in Impact. And I think that the more, the more we all, like all of us at Impact grow, the more the company is going to grow. And I feel like that's limitless, kind of. But that being said, uh, I want to outdo myself. And I know that people have said that my, my 2022 was a wild year. Uh, and my goal is just to make 2023 better. I do that. Wherever and however that might be. So, I, like, I am, again, I am a much better wrestler right now than I was at the beginning of the year. Mm. I am focused on growth and continuous improvement. And I feel like I've achieved that. And I feel like my work itself is going to keep getting better in 2023. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and like with how wrestling is evolving and changing, there's new opportunities constantly. I mean, forbidden door things that are happening now, like they never have before. I got to wrestle Kenta recently at uh, Pro Wrestling Revolver. I had a match with John Moxley. I wrestled Will Ospreay. Uh, earlier in the beginning of the year i mean i feel like i wrestled dax, Har dax harwood uh two weeks ago in a in a you know big forbidden door extraordinaire match and i feel like that just makes the possibilities endless and if i can continue to wrestle all the best wrestlers in the world and keep getting better while i do it i feel like that's uh, enough of a goal I feel like early in my career, I got a piece of advice that really stuck with me. And it was that if you're not watching your older stuff from like six months ago and kind of cringing a little and going, could have done that better, then you're not heading the right direction. That is incredibly true. And I think if, if that's not how you feel about, you know, about pro wrestling and about life in general, yeah. I think you're, you're slipping. Man. What a great, what a great spot to end this on. But before we do, I just want to say, first of all, congratulations on everything. I mean, it was a hell of a 2022. Uh, even if you could just keep, keep the same pace in 2023, I mean, it's going to be unbelievable to see. Um, 
thank you for everything. And I end every conversation talking about gratitude because it's such an important part of my life. I wake up every day, say out loud three things I'm grateful for. I do it before I go to bed too. So SBMB, what are three things that you're grateful for? Uh, so we talked about, you know, my year uh, 2022. And one of the highlights was that I got married. Uh, Congratulations. And thank you. I'm very grateful for, uh, for my, my, my wife, Veda Scott. Uh, we who heard does... a little cameo of her earlier on. That's right. Uh, and uh, With like our Simpsons impressions. More than just being grateful for for Veda, I am grateful for the voiceover they provide my life as well as my matches. Uh, anytime you that I have uh, Veda on commentary while I'm wrestling, it just feels like, especially when I watch the match back, it just feels so much better. Mm -hmm. uh, not only because we have such a connection, but also because they're such an amazing commentator and their voice on every match. It's just how much they know about wrestling and how much care and passion they put behind making every match better mm. is just uh, unmatched, I feel. Um, so that's something I'm very grateful for. Uh, I'm grateful for uh, the audience that comes to professional wrestling. I make it a point to interact with people as much as I can, uh, you know, on Twitter, on Instagram, uh, on Twitch, where I've grown such a fantastic community. And honestly, with Twitch, I was expecting there to be a lot of a lot more people who would come in and be unpleasant or mean or rude or annoying. And that, quite frankly, never happens. Mm. Everyone is so nice. Everyone is is polite at the merch table as well after and before shows. Like it, 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 it makes me angry. It bothers me when I read things about how bad wrestling fans are uh, on Twitter, which you do see a lot, which I, I quite frankly don't think is true at all. I think most people are wrestling is cool. Uh, people are great. I mean, I, I'm, I know there definitely are some weirdos who watch wrestling, but it's like those nameless faceless people who have a username with like seven numbers at the end of it and no profile picture. It's like, all right, buddy, like nobody's listening to you. It, yes, and it's very easy to get cut up. I know a lot of people, and I've, I've said this to a lot of other wrestlers who I see, they, they'll make a tweet, right? They'll give out an opinion, and then there's going to be one comment that's going to be like, no, you're wrong, and you're an idiot for thinking that, and they will reply to that one comment and ignore all the others that said, yeah, man, you're totally right, and also... Yeah. This, which I think, you know, if you're going to re respond to the mean comments, then you should respond to, you know, even more of the positive comments. I like that. Yes. Right. Uh, and then I'm going to be grateful for uh, the existence of professional wrestling and that there is such a beautiful art, for, like open ended yet concrete art form out there that just ticks a lot of boxes for me specifically but also luckily for so many other people. I love that. Again, congratulations on everything, personal and professional from this year. Can't wait to see what's next for you in 2023. So Mike, thank you so much. Thank you.